Hello, this is Robert Rickover. I'm an Alexander teacher in Lincoln, Nebraska. I teach in Toronto, Canada, and I teach online. And my guest today is Penelope Easton, who is uh, an Alexander Technique teacher in County Clare, Ireland. She studied zoology at Cambridge University, then trained as an Alexander teacher, and then worked for four years with Miss Goldie, uh, Margaret Goldie. And that had a profound effect on her. I think it's fair to say it set her off on a 30 year journey to understand, I guess, essentially what Miss Goldie was all about because she was about something quite different from uh, most of the other teachers in London at that time. Um, Penelope's written a book about her experiences and what she's learned from them. It's called The Alexander Technique, 12 Fundamentals of Integrated Movement. I'll be putting a link to her website by the interview and you can learn how to get the book from, from, that, uh, from that link. So uh, Penelope, welcome to the show. Hello, Robert. Again. And this, we're doing a series of podcast of, uh, of videos, and there'll be podcasts as well. But we're going to talk in this one about. Well, let's start with the fact that we are talking in 2021, March of 2021, and there's now a, about a year's history of a lot of teachers working online. Um, obviously no hands-on work in that kind of teaching and a lot of teachers have found it to be pretty pretty useful way to work and it sort of leads to a question because I think uh, well, I'm actually going to quote you um, it was and often still is believed that hands are needed be uh, in order for a student to get good sensory information or direction. And of course, there's no hands in online. Well, how do we reconcile that? <laughs> Any thoughts? <laughs> I'm yeah, sure there yeah, are. <laughs> there are. It's a huge question because we've spent a hundred years being told at this point um, and, and more that um, you need the teacher's hands to show you what to do because you can't do it for yourself because of faulty sensory perception. In other words, that you know, we our bodies have a set idea of where right is, and they won't knowingly put themselves somewhere wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think we can get past faulty sensory perception by using thinking, because after all, Alexander did that for himself. He got past his own faulty sensory perception. And there's various ways in which one can get past faulty sensory perception. And that's what you have to be able to do to work with hands off. So, and that's uh, what I think. Um, I don't know what, how other teachers are teaching in general, because I haven't seen a lot of other online lessons. But I believe that's what most Alexander teachers who are successfully teaching online are, are, are doing. They're working with their students thinking. I'm sure different teachers are approaching that differently but that's certainly what I do it's all about what you're thinking about is is what my students learn yeah and, and um, I think there's um there's actually some real science behind um how we can sidestep faulty sensory perception can I share it sure um, yeah you, I talked um in the first podcast I think it was about being in Miss Goldie's room and the whole room coming present um, and so you've got an expanded field of awareness and it was and Frank Pierce Jones he got that he, he understood that that's the key but the neurology has only been around really in the last 20 years to begin to explain it and I don't know whether did you ever come across um, McGilchrist's book um, The Master and His Emissary it's no. not well known in America. Um, we, we know about it in Britain because actually Malcolm Williamson did a, um, a review of it when it first came out and, and a lot of Alexander teachers in Britain and Ireland picked up on it at that point. Um, it's an extraordinary story because McGilchrist was, he was an English don at Oxford, a professor, and he suddenly one day said to himself, why am I dissecting? Why are we all dissecting this beautiful poetry? 
um, analyzing it and, and dissecting it up and stripping it down because we strip the beauty out of it. Why are we doing it? And so he was so bothered by this that he actually gave up his professorship, went off and retrained in neurology. And then he did a huge, huge study where he looked at all the right and left brain uh, research. Now, that research had been discredited for humans because the original idea, yeah, the left brain is logical and rational and has language and the, the right brain is a bit arty farty. <laughs> it's, right. You know, it's where you have visions from, but it's not at too much use. Left brain right, is a good right. one. Yeah. Um, and, and then they found that actually all the aspects of thinking are on both sides of the brain. And they went, okay, what now? But the animal people kept their research going because after all, it's the first thing you see when you see the brain, it's got this great division in it and it's got to be there. Biology is not random. It it's always has a purpose. All the animals have this division. So there'd been a lot of research in animals around the two sides of the brain. And he put the whole thing together and he realized the two sides of the brain process in different ways. And I'm going to use the analogy of birds under a bird table. And um, because there's your birds under the bird table and they're having to look very precisely. That's a seed. That's a stone. If that's a seed, I peck. And if it's a stone, I ignore it. And then that's another seed and I recognize it. So they've got to be able to identify the seeds. They wouldn't name them like we do, but they'll know a sunflower seed from a millet seed from a, of a, from a wheat seed and they'll know them as different stones. So it's, it's memory based recognition and it's a very concentrated focus. It's task oriented and it has a fragmentary attention. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. And if that's all the bird was doing, that narrow focus, they would end up as food for my cat in no time. So as the bird is pecking for the food, they've also got to be watching the entire horizon for cats, plus the sky for hawks, plus the ground for snakes. And for the unfamiliar, in other words, they've got to be watching for the unfamiliar, whereas this is watching for the familiar. And they've also got to be watching for all the social interactions of the rest of their flock. So they've got to have this 360 degree awareness and attention going on at the same time. Now, how do you do two completely different thinking processes at the same time? Well, biological genius, you put them on different sides of the brain. So the left brain is for the close focus, um, mechanical, logical, based on the known, and the right side of the brain is for that much, much bigger picture of looking for the unknown and somehow making sense of it and slotting it into the bigger picture and being open to absolutely anything. And the right side of the brain is also the one that links to movement. Um, it links to the it links to the body, whereas the left side of the brain is, is really just a thinking process. It's it's self referring, and so bring that to Alexander. And after all, what's our education system? It's left brain. They teach us to be close focused. Do this. Do this. Do this. We're a very left brain society. Our attention is fragmentary. We think in terms of tasks, and we use this reference system, which entirely references to how it was yesterday. So there I am sat on my chair and somebody tries to get me out of the chair and while well, I lurched forward yesterday, so I'll lurch today. Why would I do anything different? And so that is, if, if that side of the brain is trying to run the show, we won't do anything different. And that's why, you know, using the hands and say, well, you don't do it, I'll do it for you. And it's all about getting the pupil out of the way. But um, if you come into spatial awareness, because spatial awareness is only on the right side of the brain. So if you come into spatial awareness, you actually make a brain shift. And it feels like a gear shift, I think. And you come into this place. Miss Goldie called it coming to quiet, where you just come present and you don't have any expectation because you're just in this place of, of just awareness and sensory awareness, because again, the right side of the brain doesn't look at something just in terms of, oh, I know that. It looks at it like an artist. So the tulips on Miss Goldie's windowsill, they suddenly became fully yellow and one saw the details of the petals rather than just thinking, oh yeah, tulip, identified, known, ignore. 
which is what we tend to do. So you come into this much more aware and um, present state. And then if you can give your directions from that point and you can stay in that aware state, you can allow something totally different to happen. Because that aware state, another way of putting that might be you're in, you are in the present moment. Yeah. And so yeah. a, a mental direction issued by you to yourself when you're in that situation is not, it's not going to be uh, colored by your using that thought yesterday, for example. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And and so your your belief is that Alexander understood that at some level. I don't he may I assume he may not have known about left and right hemispheres or absolutely not. <laughs> probably not. But he somehow knew about that uh that importance of uh special awareness and we know that for example in his teaching uh studio he had objects there to almost like attract people's eyes to so they wouldn't be going in and he, i think he talks about you know don't close your eyes and go inward and i think a lot of alexander teachers today would would say that as well and he also of course talks a lot about don't concentrate because yes oh. there, that concentration gives a narrow focus and um mm -hmm. that you do actually need a sort of broader attention than that but he doesn't sort of he doesn't he doesn't press the point shall we say it's there it's there at the periphery of his uh, it's, it's i don't think it's apart from his he's talking about don't concentrate that's all he talks about in his writings and then you read madribalo or hear you know about his studio and things and Golby told me that he would stand people in front of a picture um, as he was teaching. And then halfway through the lesson, he would turn them around to face the other way and then say, tell me about the picture you would. And they would say, what picture? Um, so which says to me that he didn't say to his pupils, now look at that picture, take it all in, be aware of it, which is what I now do with my pupils. I stand them in front of, well, now I have a beautiful view. And I stand them in front of the view and I say, your job is to look at the view. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it brings them into a different place rather than just otherwise they're just sort of standing there thinking about tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think he probably was trying to get them to come present, but he didn't direct them explicitly to do so. What do you think? That's my guess. I mean, I, I wasn't around, so, but I, I know that uh, some teachers now, um, I'm thinking, for example, of uh, a teacher, Jennifer uh, Frank Collie, who lives in uh, Cincinnati, who will talk about um, just knowing that you, the students, or you, anybody, is at the center of the universe of their universe certainly and that there's a lot of stuff behind them and above them and below them and on all both sides and just knowing that just realizing that uh does change how you sit stand and move i completely agree because you know, when we're in this left brain state, I don't think we're not really conscious of us. We're, we're out there with the task. We're out there with, with what we're doing. And it's like we're not actually even part of the scene. Mm. And in fact, there's two ways of, of visual processing as well. And one is the, again, it's based on this temporal lobe, the memory and the association that just sees the scene like you're looking at a television you know, and everything is related to itself within the television, but it's not related to you. You know, you can't touch a mountain in the television and a mountain and an ant in the television might be the same size, mm -hmm. which makes no sense for real, but on a television, it makes sense. So it's not reference to yourself. And then this, the, the other way of moving, the other, the other way of seeing is, is based on the parietal, which is the movement. And that is self egocentric is the technical term for it, mm -hmm. where I am the center of it. So yes, when we bring ourselves back to the center of our own experience, then we come into spatial relationship with the room and everything changes. So yes, right. it, that's 
so important that Missy Vineyard talks about it as well, doesn't she, in terms of the, the vestibular system. Mm -hmm. She says, you know, you've got to find your up, down and your front, back and your side, side, which is the way the, the inner ear, the vestibular system, mm -hmm. again, processes that spatial awareness. So there's a whole load of processing spatial awareness in the brain that then links to the, um, the body schema, which then links directly to how we move. And from there, it's like we give the brain a whole different set of information to work with because it's, it's working with the real programs rather than the programs from yesterday, which aren't relevant in this moment. Right, mm. exactly. And you, just a final thought on this topic, you, you said that, well, Frank Pierce Jones did understand that. Is that, I, I don't remember reading, is it somewhere in one of his, in his book that he, Yes. Yeah, it's freedom to change, to also um, known earlier as body awareness and action. I think freedom right. to change is the yes. current there's, title. There's, um, I'm just curious. I, I don't remember. I'm I haven't read have it in a while. Be, well, you see, you have to be looking for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. But there's about three points, I think. One is I think awareness is key, um, page 167. Um, there's two other points that I can't immediately see in my references where they, which, which pages they are. Um, 174 is another one. Attention is what you focus on. You need to be both in and out. You need to be both with yourself okay. and your okay. environment. So if you, if you go back to it, and, um, there's a number of points. Um, you change your perception of time and space with Alexander. He writes on page seven. So if you, if you, it's one of these things you've got to be looking for it to see it probably. But um, I mean, the point I really, I think, first picked up on it when he's describing his, where he's learning from AR and AR is trying to get him out of the chair and he just keeps lurching. He just keeps going back into his old habit. And then, and AR is almost despairing of him. And then there comes a point where he realizes he has to keep this, what he calls his, this expanded field of awareness going. And then he can stay out of the way. He doesn't use that phrase, stay out of the way, but he realizes he can then let AR do it for him. And then he says, he can also give his directions and do it for himself, but only if he keeps that expanded field of awareness. And oh, there interesting, you. okay. So, so. Yeah, and he said actually, that he also comments that when he does it for himself in that way, he thinks that the effect on him lasts longer than when well, AR sure. does it for him. And isn't that interesting? Yeah, well, that would make sense. And yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's end on that on that note, if that's okay. Um, sure. My uh, my guest today has been Penelope Easton. She's an Alexander teacher in County Clare. Ireland and uh, we'll put a link to her website by the interview. You can order her book, learn more about her relationship with Miss Goldie and the influence uh, Miss Goldie had on her. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Robert.